good to be in church tonight, isn't it? Praise God. Uh, I know you've heard this song. Um, we had a, a little lady going to sing, but she was unable to do it. And so I'm going to preach a message tonight on in times like these. And, uh, you know, as I begin to think about it, uh, I mentioned it this morning about God's love. God's love bridges every area of situation in our lives. He loves us so much even when we're unlovable. Even when we're unworthy, he still loves us. He will always, let me say this to you, God will always love you. He'll never stop, ever. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes, no matter what we do, wrong, he still loves us. He loves us. I'd like to sing that. I think I've sung it a couple times. Bear with me. But I'll tell you, and maybe it won't affect you this way, but I think it's the prettiest song, not because I'm singing it, God only knows, but I think it's the prettiest words and the prettiest tune of any song I've ever heard. It just touches my heart. Maybe that's the reason. It's called Precious Love, and it's, uh, His love is precious. Uh, just listen to the words again as I sing this for you by the Lord's help. When the hand that holds the moon and stars holds mine When the heart once pierced in death keeps mine alive Oh, when the voice that calm that old raging sea now calms the storms in me that's precious love when the one who gave his life to save all souls Oh, says he, oh yes, would come to die for me alone. Thank you, Jesus. When the God and Father of all men becomes my dearest friend, Oh, that's precious love, such precious love. God's precious love is love beyond my power to comprehend. Listen to it, folks. Oh, and it's flowing, flowing in abundance without end. Oh, it's love for all eternity poured out upon a tree. Oh, it's for you and me. It's God's precious love. Listen to this verse. When the source of life rose from that terrible tomb, So the grave that's marked 
for you and me will be empty too. Oh, when those feet that bled on Calvary's holy hill walk beside me still, oh, that's precious love. Such precious love. If you know it by now, sing it. God's precious love is love beyond my power to comprehend. Don't forget it. And it's flowing. Flowing in abundance or without end. Hallelujah. Oh, it's love for all eternity poured out upon a tree. It's all for you and me. Cause it's God's precious love It's all for you and me It's God's precious love He's glad for that love. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I love him so much. I'll tell you one thing I can't conceive. Why he would love me. Why he would care for me. But he does. And he cares for you too. He cares for your kid. Your children. He cares for your relatives. He cares about that sick one in your family that doesn't seem like they want to get well. He cares about that. He cares about those in your family that haven't come back to him haven't been saved. He loves you. Thank God. He's a good God, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Thank the Lord. Well, praise God. Enough of that. You're going to be amazed, and I'm going right back to chapter 24 of Matthew. I know. You're going to say, oh, no. <laughs> That's about all I read this morning, but... Uh, I really, I'm not going to read too much of what I read this morning. I'm going to be preaching tonight from actually the very first part of the chapter, Matthew chapter 24. Isn't it nice to feel his presence, mm, to know he's with us? If I was to use a theme tonight, which goes along, I think this message really uh, sort of just takes off again from somewhat from the message this morning, with exception that it deals more or less with practical things tonight that we need to do whenever we know we need Jesus. I don't know about you, but there's times when I need Jesus, maybe it's wrong, but there's times when I need Jesus more than others. Is that wrong? There's times when I really need him. I mean now I need him and I need him bad. 
Then there's other times that he's got me on the mountain and I seem to be moving along quite well and, and I need him, but I just don't need him as desperately as I do when I'm down in that hole and need him to touch me. And tonight, I'd like to deal with this message in times like these. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 1. King James Version. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, so that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And then this morning, I picked up with verse 7 in my text and went on, and tonight I'm only reading down to verse 12 of that part. Verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, and pestilences, sicknesses, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. I stop with verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless your word this evening. Help us, Lord, again, that whatever we give from this pulpit will be only your word. I pray our ears will be open to hear and our hearts to receive. And may we use these messages today to prepare us. As I heard our brother say when he was praying over the prayer requests tonight. Lord, we can't look back. We've got to look ahead. We've got to fix our eyes on Calvary. And Lord, whatever you have for us, give us the faith as our song leader shared with us all evening. Give us the faith, O oh God, to walk that walk so we may please you. Yes, we've made our mistakes, but that's in the past. Help us to turn a new page in our lives and, and walk with you, preparing ourselves for the soon coming of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. In the Assemblies of God, ladies and gentlemen, I got, a, I got a notation not long ago from our superintendent. And uh, he is a very wise man, has served uh, for a while as a lawyer, and, and, uh, but mostly a preacher and for many, many years. And uh, Brother Trask, he's very qualified, not only very learned, but a great, great preacher of the Word. He wrote a little note to us, at least he did to me, and he said, Pastor, I want to encourage you. Even though it may seem redundant to the congregations where people have been attending the church for many years, I want you more now than ever to preach about the second coming of Christ. He said, preach it. Because he said there's going to be somebody in the audience that needs to hear it. And folks, I'll tell you something. Let us never become used to preaching on the second coming. 
Jesus, and I know, you know, we say it all the time, probably in the Pentecostal church, more than in any other church. We say it often, at least we do here. Jesus is coming soon. And I believe he is. I don't think that this old world can stand the stress much longer. I don't think the very elements of this world can stand the stress. I think something's about to break. And when it does, the only thing that will save the church is the rapture. When he takes us out of this hellishness and takes us home with him, I'm looking for that day. I'm looking for him to come. This morning I was standing in front of the mirror. <laughs> You're going to laugh at this. Well, maybe you won't. Maybe it remind you of something else. But uh, I was standing there, and I'll tell you, the hair is getting thin, and there are wrinkles and lines and drops everywhere. And I, I begin to look at myself and, and say, boy, Fred, you sure have changed. I said, I was talking to myself. My wife wasn't in there. I said, you sure have changed in comparison to when you first came here. And it's not for the better. Something inside began to say, just out of my spirit, just, it was just sort of funny. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let anything worse happen. <laughs> well, even though that sounds pretty frivolous, and uh, yet, folks, I'll tell you something. Things can't, and you know, this morning, uh, going out, I, I appreciated all the comments about, about the message. And, but you know, in a lot of churches, I want to be perfectly honest with you, they don't want to hear preaching like I gave this morning. They really don't. They consider it to be pessimistic preaching. And I don't think that a pastor should stand in the pulpit and preach down circumstances all the time. But folks, when we talk about the end of the world, there's not too many good things to talk about. And we've got to realize that this world that we're living in is about to collapse as we know it. And that God is going to allow things to evolve into where, and this is part of my message, to where men literally destroy themselves. And it's getting close to that now. In times like these, I need a Savior. In times like these, I need the Lord. Nothing else will suffice. One of my favorite preachers, Billy Graham, said these words in one of the great books that he has written recently. There is a satanic principle involved in all that is happening today. The Bible describes that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And we know him to be at work, confusing all peoples and all nations. His handiwork is to be seen at every turn. Let us but take hope that peace in our time is drawing closer. And almost overnight, in the midst of that hope, misunderstanding, suspicion, and bad faith break out anew. And the patient work of months is undone in a moment. For Satan is determined that the dark, joyless river of humanity shall continue on its tormented way until the end of time. He won over Adam in the garden, and he is convinced that he can claim the souls of Adam's descendants for himself. I thought that was such a good statement, written by Billy Graham. This evening, ladies and gentlemen, folks, in times like these, we are seeing tremendous sights, hearing horrendous stories, and reading startling reports that surround the society and the period that we now live in. Kosovo, 
Nigeria, Rwanda, Venezuela, and I could go on and on and name countries that are under particular stress, either from tremendous effects from storms. Even scientists will tell you that storms are more prevalent now than they've ever been in the history of the earth or since records have begun to be kept. At first, they blamed it on the media and said, way back, we didn't have the ability to understand and hear these reports as quickly. But now they're beginning to admit things are happening and they have no explanation for them. Venezuela, between 30 and 40,000 lost their lives in the last two weeks. The Assemblies of God has made another appeal. And I'm very happy to be able to stand in this pulpit and tell you tonight because of your missions giving, next Sunday we're going to have Missions Commitment Day. A little card will be in your bulletin. If you don't want to fill that out, that's just fine. But I'll tell you what it does do if you choose to do it. It helps us set our budget for the coming year in missions, if you would deem to do that. And it's all always confidential. But we have been privileged by your faithfulness and giving. Every time the Assemblies of God has sent us a letter, we've been able to respond and send money from our local church to help in these situations. Let me tell you something, folks. That's when missions counts. That's when the gospel counts. I'll tell you something, and this ought to hopefully make you feel good. Every single penny that is given in this church goes directly to missions. It doesn't go into our fund. We don't use it to pay light bills. We don't use it to pay preachers. We don't use it to clean the floor. It goes straight into the missions fund, and it is never tampered with, but only used for missions. Can you say an amen? You see, folks, false Christs are arising. They've got their ideas about what causes all this. But I'm convinced that the world cannot stand the evil that is on it right now. You see, folks, whether you understand this or not, this world was never meant to house this evil. It was never intended. It was to be a place of bliss. It was to be a place with its central, its central position in the Garden of Eden. There was to be purity and holiness. There was to be only God walking about in the trees, talking with His creation. Man has taken and destroyed that. And now, again, it sounds pessimistic, but sin prevails. Only the voice of the church makes the difference. Then you wonder why the pastor preaches. The church ought to have a voice. The church ought to be able to say something in this, in this time period we live in about something good, about something righteous. We ought to be able to stand up and proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord amidst a faithless population that only has faith in themselves. The Bible tells us Wars and rumors of such. Civil disobedience. Famines. Very prevalent around the world now. I don't know how many times we have sent offerings overseas because children are starving to death. There's many starving to death right in our own country. But around the world, people are starving to death because there's no food no food. Pestilence. Sicknesses. Have you ever seen it as bad as it is now? Have you ever seen 
Have you ever seen as many diseases penetrating the lives of human beings as there is today? Why is that? I want to go beyond saying it's because of sin. But I want to go to my text tonight. My text says, because it's the last days. Don't forget that. It's because it's the last days. We're getting close to the end. And let me tell you, there is a warfare going on, a warfare of principalities and powers that we cannot see with the naked eye that are happening. I don't know whether I taught last Wednesday night on this. We had a great service last Wednesday night. I taught last Wednesday night on this, that every time you come to church, demons come to. Does that make you feel funny? When you know that the powers of hell can walk through that door when you do? Now because of the blood of Jesus, and because of the power of the Holy Ghost, they are quelled, and they're not allowed to speak. They're waiting for somebody to idly sit in their pew and sort of laugh at the preacher and laugh at what God's doing, and then they'll hop right in. An old preacher that helped me get started lost faith in me a lot because I didn't do very well. Told me, he says, you know, he says, the devil's more faithful than a lot of church people coming to church. A lot of people don't realize that. I'll tell you something tonight. There is warfare going on around this church there could be some spiritual warfare going on in this church. Because we're living in the last days. Every time an individual rebels against God and does not commit their life to Christ, there is warfare going on. Demons are present. Now, folks, you can say what you want, but what I'm saying is scriptural. There's, God doesn't make people pull away from him. He only draws people to him. The only thing that can keep a man or a woman or a young person from dropping at an altar and confessing their sins and getting right with God is the powers of hell. And they're present right in the church. God, help us not to succumb. Help us to keep our eyes centered on Jesus. In times like these, I need a Savior. I need to be right with the Lord. I need to know that my, that my body and my soul and my spirit are purged by the blood. And I'm ready to go to heaven. I may, I may just leave this world quick. You know, that's what Dr. O'Keefe told me. He said, now listen, Fred, take care of yourself. He said, because that clock you got in there ticking, as fast as it starts ticking, just as fast it can quit. He said, so you better take care of yourself. One of these days, Jesus might just take me out of here. I better be ready. I better, am I, am I, I tell you, I'm, I know this is just simple preaching, but I think it's true preaching. I better keep my mind on the Lord. How many can say amen? Well, today I think I got other things to think about. We can do all we want to do, but we may never forget where we stand in God. Because he could come at the moment when we least expected. He could bust those clouds. In times like these, I need Jesus. I need not only for my thoughts to be compelled by him every moment of every day. And I don't mean, you know, you can become a, a bit ridiculous with that. I don't mean you walk around with your head in the clouds, go to work instead of doing your job, you pray. Uh, nothing wrong with praying on your knees, but if you've got a job to do, you better do your job. But by the same token, you can pray in your mind. How many understand what I'm saying there? You can pray in your mind. You can, you can, you can have your mind on the Lord and still. And in fact, if you do that, it makes you do a far better job in what you do. I better be in the right place when he comes. You see, folks, 
We have a lot of different sermons we preach, and you've heard me preach them. But tonight I'm not blaming pestilence on, on sin. Not altogether. I believe pestilence or extreme sicknesses today are coming upon us as they are because it is the last day. That's what the Bible says. That's what this chapter teaches. That in the last days you'll see these things. How about civil disobedience? Offenses and those who are offended. Betrayals. False prophets. Iniquity from which many shall grow cold. Ladies and gentlemen, in times like these, I'd like to share a few points with you. Number one, in times like these, I need to be saved from myself. One of the biggest problems with how I walk with God is me. I'm constantly getting in the road of God's will. I'm constantly getting in the road of what God wants to do with me. How I many can say, say amen? I see people smiling, and if you say, oh, me, I'll know you hear it. Uh, it, it I, all the time, I, I'm getting in positions to where God has to speak to me and say, Fred, just step out of the road. And when I do that, then God's able to do in my life what he wants to do. And he does a far better job anyway than I could. You see, we need John 3, 16. You know it. It's redundant, I'm sure, to many of us because of, of us knowing the knowledge of the Word. But I'll tell you, it's one of the most powerful, powerful scriptures. Uh, I'm not saying this to brag by any means. And I can't speak for these people now. Some of them are coming to our church, by the way. But in funerals this year, I have had 61 people commit their lives to Jesus. In funerals. Some of them are now whole families attending this church. Not all of them. I don't know where some of them are. And I can't, I can't uh, answer for them. But I know, and I'll tell you something, folks. Listen to me closely. Every single time that somebody gave their life to Jesus, John 3.16 was used. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's enough for me. I need to be saved from myself. I think more people today need to believe that they're saved. People struggle with that. In this last day, you can't afford to struggle with whether you're saved or not. You know you're saved or you're not saved. I know I'm saved. And I'm bad about making, uh, my wife says, you're just the greatest apologizer I've ever heard. Now, I know I apologize a lot about a lot of different things. And I probably I, I've apologized about this, and I'm going to apologize about what I'm going to say. If I can remember what it was. I'll tell you something, folks, tonight. This saving grace, I know I'm saved. I'm not going to apologize. I just meant, uh, you know, it sounds egotistical. And really, I can't help how it sounds. I know I'm saved. Number one. Number two, I know I'm going to heaven. Number three, the devil has no hold on me. <laughs> I, feel his I feel God's presence for that. Devil, you're a liar, wherever you may be, because you have no hold on me. I'm a child of God, washed in the blood, saved by the grace of God through the faith that our brother spoke of all evening. Last, I'm going to heaven. I know it. I have no doubt. My dad told me he'd be waiting on me. I'm going to my mom, little short mom. She's in heaven. I know she is. My mother-in-law, great woman of God. I can't wait to see those folks. I think about it more than I used to. How many here think about it more than you used to? Oh, when I was young, I didn't matter too much, but I'll tell you now, boy, it's getting closer. It's getting closer. Only four years, uh, three years, three and a half years, I'll be 60. Or four and a half. Or something. Five and a half. Six and a half. <laughs> I don't know. It's close. Four and a half. Yeah. Here's what I'm trying to say. 
it's getting closer to me going home. Pastor, you're young. Oh, I'm telling you something, folks. I'd like nothing better than for Jesus to come. I'd like nothing better than for Jesus to come. I often say it, Lord, the best answer I got for this mess, come quickly. Come quickly, Jesus. Number two, in times like these, not only do I have to know I'm saved, God save me from myself. But secondly, I believe in times like this, we need the Spirit of God to lead us. You know, folks, you talk about personal revival. Personal revival isn't going to come until the Holy Spirit starts leading us. Romans 8, 14, where do you get it, Pastor? Right here. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That's as clear as you can get. You want revival in your soul? Let the Holy Ghost lead you. Live in the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Just have an eagerness in your heart to grow closer to Jesus and be filled with His love and His power. He does it every time. Thank God. We're looking for revival. We want to see a powerful revival of souls and of the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. We want to see a revival of healing among our people. It's not right that God's people walk around sick. God's our healer. He should, and he does, and he will. But God help us to have a revival of faith, to believe that he can do that. Thirdly, I believe not only do we need the Spirit of God to lead us tonight, but thirdly, in the times like this, we need the Word to establish us. Now, you've got to listen closely tonight. Because these things inter interweave. In times like this, I need the word to establish me. 2 Peter 1, verse 10, King James Version. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. And here's the, here's the clencher. Though we know them and establish, be established in the present truth. You see, folks, boy, I'm a, I'm a stickler when it comes to the word. I believe if I'm going to go to heaven... It's going to, once I'm saved, it's going to take the word of God to keep me right so that I can get there. Without the word of God, I become a frivolous, weak Christian. I need God's word in my heart. Thank the Lord. Number four, not only do we need the scripture, the word of God to establish us in times like these, but fourthly, we need the strength of God to keep us. Philippians 4.13, here's what it says. We can do, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Some of you may be sitting in this audience tonight and you don't know how you're going to handle tomorrow's problems. What you're going to do about the mess that's going on. I want you to know that in times like these, I need to know that the strength of God can keep me. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know something I always do? You know, now I, there's times when I have worried, I know. Especially when I have these dreams. But they're past now. But you know, folks, I've always been this kind of individual. If I pray to the Lord about something, and I do it scripturally, I just lay it in God's hands. Let him do it. I expect it's going to be done. And you know, every time God's word comes through, and he always does it. He always does it. Thank the Lord. Some of you tonight have big decisions. This new year holds some tremendous decisions for you. What do I do next? God knows. 
but you're going to have to allow him to lead you and allow him to do for you what you cannot do in yourself. Number five. In times like these, we need God to sustain us. And you say, well, Pastor, you just said we need the strength of God to keep us. There's a difference between God keeping you and sustaining you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19 says, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I don't know whether you believe that or not. I'm sure many of you do. But I want you to know that my God is able to supply every need you have. I don't care what it is. He'll supply it for you. And he'll bring it to pass in your life. He will. Isn't that right, folks? He'll bring it to pass. I've never seen it to fail, ever. I look back, you know, and you know, everybody struggles. You go through these cycles. Everybody in life goes through cycles. And you go through times when you're young and vigorous, and then you, you get married. <laughs> I didn't mean to sound such a downer. Uh, you get married, and after you get married, then you face all kinds of responsibility. And maybe you're ready for it, and maybe you're not. And you go through good times, and then bad times, and then good times, and then bad times. The thought goes to a young preacher we have in our section. He came and preached for us not too long ago. He pastors over, in, in, uh, over on Interstate 70. I can't remember the name of the place now. But anyway, he's such a fine young man. His wife, she was sitting in our audience that night when he was preaching, and she wept the whole service. And I didn't understand why. And here, here I come to find out that their little boy who was downstairs in our nursery, his brain is filled with growths. His lungs are filled with nodules. They're growing everywhere. And this mother quietly sat in her pew. Her and her husband are pastoring a brand new church over on Interstate 70. Started it themselves with nobody and now they have 30 people. All of them used to be Catholic, and they've turned their lives to Christ. They're meeting in, the, in, in a fire hall. They don't own a place of their own. On Sunday mornings, they meet in a fire hall. On Wednesday nights, the people come and meet in the front room of their home, and that's what they do. That night in our church on the other side before we moved in here, it's only been a month ago or two months ago, he was here. His wife sat there quietly and sobbed and cried. After the service, she brought their son up and said, Pastor Tomlinson, you used to be our presbyter. Would you lay hands on my baby and pray that God would heal him? I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to lose him. Because now the doctor says my new baby is going to be the same way. We laid hands that night, and some of the men come around. And we anointed that little boy, probably four years old. Two weeks ago, the doctor said, I don't know what's happened. He said, these growths are going away. They're going away. They're going away. This woman's beside herself. She says, I just don't know what to say. I said, you don't have to say anything, sister. I, my God, is able to supply all your needs. He's able to do exceedingly above and beyond that which I could ever ask or think. In times like these, I need Jesus. See, he still heals. Some of you know that, don't you? I shouldn't pick anybody out, but Sister Vi won't care, I guess. I remember just recently when she went to the hospital and had to have uh, surgery on the back of her brain. And they took a growth out of her uh, next to her brain just a matter of a few months before that or maybe a year before that. I forget how long that was. Uh, they did whatever they did. I'm not sure. But today... This woman sets in this church well. Well. Can you say amen? See, Satan doesn't quit. And 
now he's attacked her husband and he's been diagnosed with cancer but oh, I went over to their home the other day I was so warmed by your husband's attitude he's so open to Jesus now I'll tell you something folks God works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform he's still in the business of healing and even though pestilence and earthquakes and famines all these things in diverse places my God is able to keep his church through it all how many remember when Israelites were in Egypt they, the Egyptians had the botch it's some big kind of stuff. I don't know what it was. Big blotches, I guess, or something. Sores, and it, it killed them. It destroyed them. It was a, it was a disease. But the Bible said not one Israelite was touched by any disease. Why? Because, you see, God had his hand on them. Now, I'm going to tell you something, church. You live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in times like these, why do I say we need Jesus? Because in times like this, there isn't any answer for you eternally other than him. There isn't. And, and he wants to keep you while you're here. He wants to keep you healthy. He wants to keep you going. But there's one thing we have got to do. We have got to make up our mind. We're going to trust him. And we're going to live for him. And we're going to put him first. That's why I've been like I've been for the last couple services because I want to start this new year out right. I want our church to be on track. I want healing to prevail in, in a world system today where sickness prevails. I want God's church in Mount Morris to be whole where sin abounds. His grace much more abounds. I want His grace to abound where sin has abounded. I want the victory of the Holy Ghost to lead God's people and give them strength to walk with their head high. No Christian needs to walk with their face in the ground. We got lots to be proud of. Not, I'm not talking about physical pride or, or egotistical pride. I'm talking about lifting up our head and saying, I'm a child of God and I'm happy about it. And I'm not ashamed of it. I want people to know I love God. And that's the kind of stuff in this last day that counteracts everything in text of chapter 24 of Matthew. I believe for every force of evil that is mentioned in chapter 24, God is able by his power for the church to counteract it. How many believes that? I've never seen the church in famine. Now, I'm not being frivolous here either. But I've been in pastoring now 35, 36 years, and I have never once seen the church in famine. I have never seen the church without. Why is that? Because in times like these, we have Jesus. He's the head of the church, He's going to take care of His family. He's going to take care of his own. Praise God. He's not going to let you go down the drain. The devil would like to flush you right down. But, but God says, no way. Maybe the rest of the people in this, whatever their constituents is, maybe they're going down the drain. They're going to hell if they don't straighten out. But I'll tell you, I'm not going to let my church go the same route. And God has a power of counteraction. How many believes that? For every single one of those things. That's why they're, they're in the midst of all sickness and disease. My God is healing sicknesses everywhere. Where people are just tormented with mental uh, depression and all kinds of problems, my God is freeing the minds of Christian people who bring themselves to the foot of the cross and say, God, I don't know what my answer is, but I need your help. And all of a sudden, the power, the delivering power of Jesus Christ begins to deliver us from that depression. moralizing thoughts. You're with me, aren't you? i got to quit, too. You see, folks, I'd like to read it to you. Number six. In times like these, we need fellowship. Two ways. One with Jesus, 
the other with people like faith. I need you. I say this not frivolously, and I believe this to be the truth. Uh, Anybody can be replaced. Anybody can be replaced. That includes me. I don't know whether you need me, but I need you. This church is my lifeline, other than God. This church brings me pleasure. I wake up in the morning, I'm the preacher, I guess that's why. I wake up in the morning and you know what's on my mind? The church. When I go to bed at night, guess what's on my mind? The church. When I'm out in the middle of the day, guess what's on my mind? The church. And all I do all day long is let my mind roam. Who needs me today? Who needs help? Holy Spirit, show me who I need to call or check on. Help me, Jesus, to be tender toward that need. And the Holy Spirit, it's enjoyable, folks. I love it. I love it. I love doing it for Jesus because, you see, I need you. i got to pray for you because I want you to be around. And I want this church to be strong and healthy and viable. As long as this church stays strong and healthy and spiritual and viable, you'll never have to worry about finances. We'll never have to talk about them. And you know, folks, I don't talk about it very often. That's who I am. I believe my God shall supply all my needs. He'll supply all of our needs. And I'll tell you one thing, if a church is happy in Jesus, you'll never have to worry about the financial part. Never. It'll always be there. Because happy people in Jesus, and I don't know how I got on this, happy people in Jesus give good. I didn't mean for you to quiet down, but uh, because that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to talk about giving or tithing. I'm just talking about being happy. Now, you know the devil brings in on me. And he tries to tell me, you know, things look okay now. I'll tell you one thing. Later on this year, buddy, you're going to wish. I have to wake up and say, oh, Jesus. You're still there, aren't you? You still there, Jesus? And he says, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. You're never going to walk alone as long as you're my child. In this awful day when you don't know what the finances are going to be, whether somebody has a job or they don't, Jesus reminds me every single day, it's not your church, nor it's not your people's church. It's my church. I will take care of my church no matter what happens. That's what gives me confidence. In times like these, the whole world seems to be collapsing around us. I need Jesus. I closed with this. I counseled with a couple not long ago. And I told them, I said, do you know what love really is to me? And they said, what? I said, love is this. Love if the whole world collapsed around you. Everything. Your house fell to the ground. The wheels fell off the car right in front of you. You lost your job. The town burned down. Everything just went into an awful, awful disarray. And you had each other. That's all you need. That's how we got to think about God. Jesus, no matter what happens, I have you. Isn't that, a, isn't that a, just a peaceful, peaceful reassurance? Jesus, no matter what happens, I may not get that pension. I may not get that reward. I may not get that financial benefit. Maybe the people aren't treating me right at work. Maybe I'm not going to get what I thought I was going to get. But God, I don't care. Because you're the one. In times like these, you're the one that will keep me. That's why I'm still standing here. 
Would you bow your heads with me, please? Tonight, we're going to have an altar call. We're going to gather around the altar. We're going to pray. We're going to seek the Lord. And we're just going to pray as long as God wants you to pray. But while we're doing this, I think there's some folks in this congregation tonight that just need to lay some things in the hands of God. Say, Lord, I've worried about them too long. I've tried to deal with it too much. In times like these, oh God, I need you. And just lay these things down and let God have them. I'll tell you, folks, it brings a peace to your life like you've never had before. It'll bring a peace, a consolation. Maybe, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, somebody would say, Pastor, I'm going to step out of my seat and I'm going to come up here and pray and I need to be anointed. I'm going to have to lay something down here because I just don't know how to handle it. The more I seem to do, the worse things get. Tonight, I need to lay it at the foot of Calvary and let you take it, Jesus. If that's you tonight, why don't you walk out a while? Drop down at this old-fashioned altar on either side. And say, Jesus, when I leave this church tonight, I'm going to be able to say like the preacher preached in times like these, I need a Savior. I'm turning it all over to you. Would you come? Before we go any further in this, coming, Pastor. I'm going to drop it right here. Right here. Right here. Right now. I'm going to drop it. I'm not going to carry it any longer. I'm not going to carry it any longer. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I don't know how much more I can take. times like these, Pastor, I need Jesus Christ. Are you willing to make that commitment? Lay it down and let go of it? That's what you're going to have to do. That's what you're going to have to do.